Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is Coffee with Shane again. Uh, it's Monday morning, and um, it is uh, hopefully you had a wonderful Easter uh, Sunday and spending time with your family and your friends. Well, probably not a whole lot of friends, but your families is at least. And uh, Lord willing, you experienced a great time of uh, fellowship with, with Him. And, um, and maybe this year, part of our part of our focus was a more intentional why do we gather what do we gather for what what's the purpose of easter um i know for myself as i was wrestling with um doing an online service and looking thing looking at things uh this week i, I think that part of what i what i came to recognize in my own heart was the 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 purpose of of our celebration of easter um, it, it's not just to, uh, to, to, to do an, a, re, a religious event, but it's it's truly to celebrate, to remind one another, to um, to help g- get our eyes back on um, what's truly important around the gospel and the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And um, so, what a beautiful picture it was! Uh, good morning, Pam. Good to see you. Um, what a challenge it was! A difficult, different day. Um, I, I really appreciated Ben and Jerry being on with me. In fact, I totally missed a great opportunity for a little bit of a joke because for the first time in my career, I had Ben and Jerry on the stage and we didn't offer ice cream or anything. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, now that it's Monday, I can I can make my joke about having Ben and Jerry together all at once. So, um, as I said in my notes, as, as I was starting this morning, uh, good morning, Steve. Good to see you. Um, I... Uh, what I was re- I was just wrestling with some uh, several thoughts today on on where do we go how how do we how do we continue and engage and um, as we think about over the next uh, week and a half two weeks as we finish out April and 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 we begin to pray I, I, I'm praying about what's coming next and 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 how do we deal with this I, I really want to encourage you um, and I think we'll see it in our in our text even today. Um, but man, be praying for God to, to change, to remove, um, you know, th- this scenario to, to change the, uh, just the whole circumstance, um, to where we can be, be back to gathering together, be engaged as a church as we're used to, um, I think we should be praying for that. We should be praying for our leaders and praying for our, all of these things that are included in this. Good morning, Candy, Kathleen, good to see you. Hello, Kay. Um, I know some of you are, are are gathered up as well. So Dick, good morning. Good to see you. Um, but I want to really encourage us uh, to be praying for um, the leadership, praying for this time frame to be cut short and um, to be doing that together. So good morning, Francie. Uh, Bill and Sue Houston, good to see you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so in, in light of that, I, I found myself wrestling this morning with, okay, Lord, what do we what do you want to talk about? What what is it that we want to we want to address? Uh, good morning, Julie. Good to see you. I am uh, and, and honestly one of the things that I was wrestling with, and and we're not going to talk about it. We're not. I'm not quite ready yet. Um, it may be later, but one of the passages that I'm wrestling with is First Corinthians nine nineteen through twenty seven, um, where Paul is talking about how he's being all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. And what does that mean? What does it look like? Um, this morning I want to I'm going to stay focused in in Psalms. I've been wrestling with that today, and and there's just a few thoughts that I think will be encouraging for us as we consider what what God might be doing right now and 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 where He's directing our hearts and uh, just the, the the just being reminded of what the truth is. I will tell you this um, for our staff for our team as as we sit in the sanctuary on Sunday and we're doing, uh, that, that live stream, um, that you, that you joined with us. One of the things we all feel is the emptiness of the space, the, 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 the void that's there because we weren't together. We weren't, um, able to actually fellowship. And I think for me, the height, the heightened awareness of that privilege of that gift that we have to be together and to celebrate together. Good morning, Amanda. It's good to see you guys today. Um, that that is not being lost. That that part of that process has been very very uh, encouraging, but it's also um, been really uh, reflected in my own feelings and my own heart towards the church. 
Um, and so I'm, my, my prayer is, part of my prayer is that as we regather, as, as God um, allows us to, to come together as a church and to celebrate as a church, that, that we would actually engage that with greater joy, greater passion, um, greater appreciation for one another, greater appreciation for the individual gifts that God's given us, the unique goofiness that he's given us. Um, I actually heard uh, Garth Brooks uh, made a statement the other day, and, and um, I really appreciated it because uh, he was focused on the fact that we as a nation um, need to get back to the spot where we can disagree with one another and still be friends. We can we can have difference, differences of opinions and still engage and talk to one another, not be hostile, but to listen and to, to talk about the issues that are at hand. Um, and to genuinely be in dialogue. And I really appreciate that because I actually disagree with him on, on, on a couple of things as far as um, uh, like what the world needs, how, how we fix some of the problems that we have. But the principle of the fact that we can engage with one another, be different, have different opinions, and, and still be friends and, and not, have to, not have to treat one another poorly um, has been of great encouragement to me. And I, and I really appreciate it because I think that he's right. Um, when I think of the lost right now, as I'm thinking about uh, those who are in fear, and as we, we talked about it yesterday, that, that the lost, those who don't know Christ, they are legitimately scared and they should be. But man, it, it's not just COVID. It's not just that, it's not just that we're um, that there's going to be a, a, a death now or they're more susceptible to death. There's people dying every day. Um, thousands of people dying every day and and many of them going to a Christless eternity and I just have been overwhelmed with that reality um, again yesterday as I was coming in to, to this morning um, so I kind of want I want to share some of that with you very interestingly uh, David as you know he is very honest with God and he talks about his feelings about the wicked and the uh, the his enemies and um, and he's gonna do it for us again this morning in Psalm 11, Psalms 11. Um, so if you would grab your Bibles, open them up to Psalms 11, and let's just take a few minutes and, and read this passage, and Lord willing, it will be of great encouragement uh, to you this morning as we engage this. So hopefully you got your coffee. You see, I got my coffee. I actually snagged my cup from church. Um, so Liberty Lake Church, just in case you didn't know how to spell that right there. Yeah, see? Anyway. So be sure, um, grab your Bibles and follow along with me. Psalms 11, verse 1. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes See, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coal on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but there's times where I read the Psalms and... Um, you know, again, we're seeing that David's reminding, he's reminding himself, I think he's also reminding the children of Israel that God's in heaven, that, that he sees the things that are going on. He's aware of them. He's not, he's not disregarding them. He has a plan and a purpose, and it's bigger than just the immediate, um, the momentary. But sometimes when I read this, I think to myself, man, David sure doesn't like people very much. He's got some enemies, and he, you know, he's praying for coal. To rain, you know, to rain coal on the wicked, fire and sulfur to scorch, a scorching wind. <coughs> Excuse me. Basically, that they'd be wiped out. And I just wonder sometimes if that's not. Uh, I guess maybe what I'm wrestling with is being convicted about sometimes feeling that way in our culture, in our political culture, in our social media culture in our <clears throat> current pattern of wickedness and, and rampant um, pursuit of evil. And, and I find my heart at times frustrated with this, with our current circumstances. And I want desperately uh, for there to be transformation and change and, and, 
and <clears throat> for their you know for these things to happen. In fact, I was uh, listening to uh, um, a reporter who was interviewing. Uh, the head of the infectious disease who's working for Trump now. <clears throat> and he was, they were uh, talking about how, man, if we would have shut down the country earlier and, and all this stuff uh, and how we could have saved a few lives. And honestly, what happened in my heart when, it, when, the, when this reporter made that comment, I, I found myself frustrated with that whole idea because, man, if we were going to save lives, there'd be a whole lot of other, if it was really saving life that we were worried about, we'd, we'd shut down a whole lot of other things, right? Abortion clinics, um, um, the, the the people that are texting and driving and killing people, people that are dying from drug overdoses. Uh, I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. I mean, even you take just the people that die on a daily basis from medical um, mistakes that are made in the hospital. and I mean, just, there's just so many different aspects of death where, where people are dying on a daily basis. And, and yet somehow now because of this covid thing um uh, you know a life being lost is uh, is now a significant issue um and i find myself i'm like oh you, you're making this a political thing you're you're just being you know you're doing whatever you're doing and i and i get distracted or frustrated by that and then i read psalm 11 and david says god's in heaven he sees all this he's watching all this we don't have to worry about it and then david cries out lord kill them all kill everybody that doesn't love that that doesn't follow you just wipe them out and then i asked myself as i was going through that this morning i'm like lord is that is that your heart for the world is that your heart for people how do we how do we deal with this i think if we grab other scripture, it'll help us to kind of wrestle with this and put our heads around this this morning. So turn to your Bibles with me to First Timothy chapter two. I just I want to read two different passages that I think will help give us a, a broader scope, a bigger picture, um, and it'll it'll maybe put it into perspective how we as Christians today, as children of the kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus under the headship of Christ, how we should be addressing this, how we should be. Uh, seeing our culture and and responding to our culture, uh, the the first passage is First Timothy chapter two verse one. It says this: First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Here Paul is challenging the church to pray, not just for one another, um, not just for the lost, but for the leadership, for the kings, for, for all of those involved um, with the idea, with the intent that we might live a peaceful, godly life, that we, because of their leadership, because of their influence that, that God brings, that it would be that case for all of us, recognizing that God's heart, his desire is that all would be saved. He would want us to live in such a way that those around us would be impacted by his, the reality of who he is, the truth of who he is, and that they would respond to that truth. That it, would be, it would be overwhelmingly evident that the disciples of Christ believed what they said and lived in, according, in an according fashion to that belief system, to what they state they believe. I don't know if you can say in an according fashion. I'm not sure. Who knows? Those, that's one of my things where I just make up words and make up sentences if it works or not. I do not know. You guys can correct me later. Do we have an English major in the house? Probably. Francie, you could probably help me with that, right? The second passage is this. Second Peter 3, 1 through 13. I don't know about you, but um, I don't do a good job of praying for all my leaders. I don't do a good job of praying for the government, praying for uh, Jay Inslee. I don't. Um, because I, 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 I at times think that what they're doing, I assign motives that may or may not be right, and my heart gets hard, and I get frustrated. And in that moment, I think the reality is I forget that God's in control. I forget that God actually is sovereign over these things, and he's called us for a purpose and for a mission. Second Peter 3 says this, and this one was very convicting for me this morning. 
2 Peter 3 1. This is now the second letter <clears throat> that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring you, uh, excuse me, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the uh, predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all these things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that are now uh, that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should re reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies with, will all be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works uh, that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, li in, life of, uh, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. As we think about this whole context of, of being, you know, man, is this the end? Is, is, is this, is the end coming soon? Well, it, it is in, in, in the reality of, of an eternal existence for God. Once he started the time clock, the end was drawing near every day. Every day we we're closer. I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime or in the next lifetime. Does it happen tomorrow? We don't know. It says in fact that it's going to come as a thief in the night, but we do see some very in, in, important aspects for us to remember as disciples one that we're to be living these this holy and godly lives in in light of the fact that it could come at any time that that we should be engaged in discipleship in 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 godly living in pursuing god in a relationship and and he reminds us as well that in god's time out, outside of time in in eternity that a day is as a thousand years this isn't a set that every day equals a thousand years or every thousand years equals a day uh, just let that go. I'm, we can talk about that later. That's a whole nother discussion. The point being that the context here is that Peter is encouraging the church because they're becoming discouraged in the midst of persecution and, and anticipating God's uh, Jesus' return, and they're becoming discouraged, and he's encouraging them to say, wait on the Lord. Recognize that what God's doing, the, the delay that you're experiencing isn't him failing to show up it's him being patient with us so that we will fulfill excuse me we will fulfill our commission our what he's given us to do god's plan in getting the gospel out and and in and, and living in such a way that the world those who are his children will be brought to full repentance and and brought to heaven think about it this way in your relationship with let's say uh your spouse it, we'll just use for an example my bride for many, many years of my my life as a Christian, even when I was pastoring, I would I would get out my Bible and I would read stuff for Sunday morning or I would prepare something for a youth group, but I didn't take time to be with the Lord on my own. I didn't come in and pursue Him, to know Him, to understand His words, to, to allow the Word to penetrate and reflect on my life for transformation purposes. I just didn't do it. I didn't take time alone. So the reality is, is that normally what I would see is I would see a couple of hours a week where I'd be in the Word, um, and that was it. That was it. All the rest of my time, I'd be busy doing other things, busy setting up programs or running around seeing people or, or doing projects at home or working on cars, whatever it was, I was busy in life. And as I was thinking about how good does that work in relationship? Just imagine if we, if you would, in, in, in your in your marital relationship, if you were to only invest a couple hours of week into the relationship with your spouse. Now, now here's the hard part, right? For some of us, that's actually what we're doing today. 
Um, we, we actually invest very little into our marriage. We spend very little time listening and engaging our spouse, trying to get to know what their needs are, to hear their heart, to understand where their spiritual health is. We spend very little time doing that because we're so busy with life. I, I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm confessing to you. I did that for many, many years. But it doesn't build a deep, meaningful, strong relationship. In fact, if we were to be perfectly honest, we would have never, that, that in the, whoever your spouse is, husband or, or wife, they would have never been interested in you had while you were dating, you, you had given them that amount of time. I mean, if we were dating and I only ever interacted with Sally a couple of hours a week, what would she have seen? that I was too busy with other things, that I was very had very little interest in her. Now, I'm a good salesman, so when we were dating, I made sure she knew I thought she was the world. But that became very uh, obvious in my selfishness and in my self-focused uh, immaturity as a young man when we got married and not long after that I began to get busy with work and I began to get busy with with other things that held my passion and that held held my heart more than my bride did now imagine if we do that with the Lord how many of us because we don't see the Lord we, he's not engaged he's not daily present with us how many of us uh, is Sunday all that God gets a Sunday morning Maybe it's a Wednesday night. Maybe we even add a, a life group. But how many of us live in that relationship claiming to be children of God, claiming to be in an intimate relationship with the Lord, but we don't engage, we don't build, we don't pour into that relationship? I don't think we're going to be able to see the end of the world, to see the the lost in the world, to see God uh, sitting in heaven, watching over these things as a sovereign God and trust him, engage with him, engage with the world to be faithful and obedient to live these holy and godly lives that we see in second peter i i don't think we'll even be able to really pray like we saw in first in first timothy to pray for the world that that we would have god's heart for even them if we don't engage in a in a meaningful relationship with the lord and what a what a time you guys what a, what an amazing time for some of us, our schedule has been changed enough that we can actually be at home and be in the Word and engage in this process with the Lord and not be distracted by a ton of other stuff. Are we taking advantage of that? Are we finding time to get to know the Lord? Even Sundays, what has Sunday become for you? We used, you know, we were committed to being at church for an hour or two, depending on what your involvement is. Maybe three for some of us crazy people that are there early and, and, and are there till it closes. But, but what are your Sundays involved now? I believe that this time, it's, it's really opened up an opportunity for us to evaluate our hearts and say, God, are you really important to me? Am I really in a relationship with you? Do, do, I, do I see you like David sees you in Psalms? Do I see you like Paul sees you, sees you as he writes his epistles? Do I see you the ways that, that, that Peter seems to understand your process, your presence? Do I recognize that you're coming, that, that you're going to fulfill all your promises, and that there's going to be a day where as your child, I'm, I'm in the new heaven. Do I really see my life that way? Do I really see my relationship that way? I think right now in this moment, in this time, what a perfect opportunity it is for you and for me to really expose the, the inside of our hearts and say, God, help me to see how I'm living. Help me to help me to see what my priorities are right now. I believe that in a couple of weeks, we're going to start seeing the, 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 our world begin to return back to what, what used to be. And I'm not going to say it's normal. I don't want to. I don't want to classify that as normal. I don't think. I honestly don't believe that the church, as a whole, was was as alive as it should be. I want to be very careful how I say that because I'm not going to say that the church is dead. But but the reality is, I think that many of us live in a relationship with God that is almost a life support relationship. And, and I know that sounds horrible, but, but think about it. When, when was the last time that, 
that you looked at your life and you suspended your activity, a lot of your activity, even to the even to the point of of losing income, to spend time with God, to hear from the Lord, to to uh, to engage in your eternal health, your spiritual health. The reality is, is that uh, if if I, if I if I wasn't probably where I'm at as a pastor, um, I, I don't know that my heart would be as open to this. And so I'm wrestling with that conviction to say, God, is this is this me, or do I engage your word because it's my job, and and therefore I'm expected to come up with things to say that sound spiritual, and so therefore I engage your word, or or is this is this really my relationship? Am I desperately interested in what you think? Am I desperately interested in knowing who you are so that my life will begin to reflect that truth? The conviction of my own heart is um, that I'm not nearly as desperate for that as I should be. I'm not nearly as dependent as I should be. I'm, I'm not nearly as aware of my Savior as I should be. I don't know him. I don't I don't understand him as much as I should. And I have so much in the text. We have we have so much available in his word that would direct us to who he is and what his thoughts are and what he cares about. So here's my challenge for you today is that we would take a few minutes this morning when we close this time that you would stop what you're doing, whatever it is. You would turn off the music. You would turn off the TVs. You would turn off the phones. You would get alone for just a minute and say, God, do I know your voice? God, do I know your heart for this world? Do I know your heart for me today? Father, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I care about your word enough to change my life that it would reflect the values that I see in there. And Lord, I want to know you more. I want to hear from you today. Would you do that? That's my challenge. Would you do that this morning as we close? I'm going to shut this thing off here in just a moment. And I, I really want to encourage you to plead, to seek the Lord, to cry out to God this morning. He is your refuge. He is in heaven. Psalms 11 reminds us of who he is. And, and it also reminds us about how, how a holy, just God can't engage. He, 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 he isn't, uh, he's against evil. He, he's, he's a, it opposes him. And, and we should see that and re, we should reflect in those issues of sin, the issues of, of coldness and distance that we see in our own hearts. And we should, we should cry out to the Lord and say, God, not me. Don't, don't let that be my heart. Bring a change. Wake me up. Bring life. I, I want to live. I don't want to be attached to the old my old self. I don't want to continue in the patterns of my flesh. That's, that's the cry. That's the, that's the passion of our hearts. That's, I think, the reflection that we should have as we consider what we're learning from this time of isolation and separation is that we're not separate from God. He doesn't he, he doesn't we don't have to go to the church to find him. We don't have to we don't have to 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 be uh, uh you know together you don't have to hear a sermon to find him. You can open your word, you can open his word and read and engage a holy living God right now in your homes wherever you're at, whatever your circumstances are, you can engage him there. That's the challenge this morning. Would you engage God this morning and cry out to him and ask him to make himself known, to open your heart, to hear and to see who he is, and maybe even to give you a heart for this, for this time, a heart for your neighbors, a heart for this community, a heart for the lost who are, who are terrified and living in fear. That God would transform their hearts. That God would transform our hearts. And that we would live in a way that reflects Him. May God bless you today as you pursue Him. May God bless you this morning by engaging you and by speaking to your heart as you open His Word today and as you ask Him to, uh, to draw near to you so that you would hear and, and know Him. 
God bless. Have a great day pursuing the Lord. Love y'all. Bye.